Hey doctors, this is Dr. Adishina from Smash USMLE Reviews. Listen, I know you've heard the news that the USMLE Step 1, as of January 2020, that's the earlier, it's gonna be going to pass or fail. Wow! This is amazing! It's great news and it's also bad news, all right? Let's talk about the good news first, right? You know, let, let me give you guys some background information. Um, you guys are gonna become physicians. And when you come to my program, I always tell you guys, I wanna train you to become a better physician, understand pathology, pathophysiology. But the truth of the matter is, listen, when you become a doctor, right? I'm an ER physician and I see patients in the ER. Do you remember the last time that I actually have to worry about chromosome number 13 mutation. Never, ever, no, all right? Do you remember any time I have to worry about somebody has a um, HFE or you know, like a C287Y uh, mutation of some sort? We never do in clinical medicine, all right? This is what geneticists, they deal with, all right? When you go to an academic institution and they have geneticists that will be able to do like chromosome analysis and all those things, we doctors, who actually practice medicine at the bedside don't ever have to worry about this now it's good that you know some of this information but clinically these some of these diseases are so rare so rare that your odds of actually seeing them and diagnosing them is really really low like lysosomal story diseases pompies diseases, all these diseases that you learn in biochemistry are not i'm being honest with you important in clinical practice now, are you going to see diabetes? Absolutely. Are you going to see high cholesterol? Absolutely. Are you going to see patients with hypertension? Absolutely. All right? So over the long years, students have struggled to memorize, cram, try to understand all this extraneous information that when you enter into the hospital and actually start practicing medicine, you don't use. Okay? Now, so there's been a, an ongoing, right, uh, meetings for the last year or two just try to change this step one exam to a pass fail because that's how you used to be like 30 years ago. You just gotta pass the test, right? And then something happened. And let me tell you what exactly happened. We had shortage of residencies. That's the problem, guys. The main problem with this whole concept of let's change step one to pass or fail stems from the fact that there is a high demand, but it's less supply, right? Thousands and thousands of students are applying every year for jobs. That's what you guys are doing as medical students. IMGs, U.S. medical students. You just, just went through medical school, got an MD degree or DO degree, and then you're trying to get a job so you can get trained. That's all it is. You're just underpaid. That's a little difference, right? Now, it, the solution to the problem is to be able to allow the government, Medicare, to be able to sponsor more residency spots. Not changing step one to just pass or fail. That is just putting a band-aid on a wound. Because you and I both know that all these residency program directors are overwhelmed. And if you don't know this, they are overwhelmed with the amount of applicants that they're getting. And now there's a bottleneck effect over the last year, couple, you know, like last decade of step one mania. A, a U.S. Uh, medical student only needs step one to get into residency. That's it. An IMG needs to take step one, step two, step two, CKCS, even sometimes step three, to just show that you're on the same level playing field with an U.S. medical student who only took step one to get into residency. Also, if you don't do well on step one, let's say you get, got it like a 199 or something like that, you have a chance as a U.S. student to be able to increase your score in step two, CK, and prove to residency program directors, like, listen, I've done, I didn't do so well in step one, I can do better in step two, CK, right? So what does this all mean, right? There's a couple of changes they have made to the USMLE, right? The first one is, is going pass and fail. The second is that you only have four attempts to be able to take the USMLE, right? Instead of six, it used to be six. You only have only four attempts to be able to take the board exam. And the third change is that you have to take step one before you take step two, CK, CS, and then step three, right? which is how it's supposed to be because, you know, a lot of IMGs, they can't tend to be able to bypass that process before, right? So let's talk about how this impacts international medical graduates. Nobody really knows the answer of what exactly is going to happen, but I'll tell you what I think is most likely going to happen when this comes to residency selection process because an IMG is going to be worried now. Listen, 
I got a 260 on step one, and that's my playing field to show students who are getting 230s that I just know exactly what I'm doing, and I'm able to basically compete with like U.S. medical students, right? So what I propose or what I'm suspecting what will happen is, listen, we're just shifting the gear from step one to step two CK. That's what will happen, guys. That is most likely what I think will happen because if program directors used to use step one as the yardstick to what you to get into residency, they would just say, all right, fine. Since you got enough step one to pass or fail, right, we're going to look at your step two CK scores in step three, right? Now, that would be for IMGs. They would probably, you know, you're going to have to take step two CK and step three and step two uh, uh, and CS, which is just a pass or fail, and we're still staying the same, right? Now, my worry is this. I'll tell you what I'm worried about, right? The current average on step two CK is 240. Like, that is an insane number at this point in 2020. What will happen by 2022, 2023? Because the scores always tend to go up a little bit by one or two points, right? So, yes, we are solving the problem and saying, hey, you know what? Step one is not highly clinical relevant. It's just basic, basic sciences. But guess what we're doing? We're now going to push all these resident program directors. They have to use a number. I'm telling you guys, they have to use a number to be able to screen applicants out. So they'll probably focus on, all right, we're going to look at the step two CK as the most important predictor now, which is you know, more clinical. They're going to look at your letters of recommendation, all right? Now, the problem is that they will not be able to use your school grades because every school grades differently, right? Clinical rotation grades is so subjective that if you do a surgical rotation or, or uh, any internal medicine rotation and the guy that's just there is just a jerk and he doesn't give honors or, like, it just it's just a really, really difficult program that you did a rotation in, and you get like a pass or a high pass, right? And you need a, that honors on A in that, that um, hospital. Guess what? There's nothing you can do. It's really, really, really subjective, right? Um, some people write excellent letters of, letters of recommendations. Some people don't. But most of the time, you know, letters of recommendation is highly, highly, highly regarded when you apply to residency because whoever you shadow is basically judging you based on your performance on that rotation. So obviously your clinical grade is going to be more important. Your step two CK is going to be more important moving forward. And moreover, like, you know, letters of recommendation from the faculty is very, very more important. And also, here's my worry, especially for IMGs, is that they may start to focus on who you know, kind of like a connection kind of basis. I think that's where I kind of find that might be a big hiccup, especially for IMGs, because when you're applying to residency, you really don't know a lot of people, and you're just banking on the fact that your step one score is going to speak for you. So what I see is going to be the paradigm shift is going to be your step two CK is going to be the only thing that can, um, you know, be the best thing you can use to show that, hey, listen, I'm just on good, if not better than I am, uh, U.S. students who've taken the USMLE exam itself. So that is what my proposal is going to be. Now, when it comes to pass or fail, right, don't get too excited. U.S. students currently, 92% of them pass the USMLE. 8%, even at the current standard of the USMLE, they still fail the USMLE. The IMG students who used to take the USMLE, are still currently taking the USMLE, 30% of IMGs fail the USMLE anyway. So don't get too excited because the failure for IMGs has persistently been much, much higher over the last decade, right? So, but here's also the catch. You used to be able to skip this exam and say, let's say you come from Cuba, you come from like Ghana or something like another country. You, a lot of doctors who practice in their country before who are international medical graduates, they come here, get ECMG certified. And because they have been clinicians for years and years and years, you feel like, listen, I can take a clinical exam faster, right? Because so, so I get this rationale all the time. Dr. Adishina, listen, I'm just going to go and take step two CK first before I take step one. I got bad news now. Guess what? You can't do that anymore after 2022, right? You are now going to be forced to take that exact step one exam, make sure you pass it, knowing that the number of people that actually pass it as IMGs the first time is only 70% or 75% of, uh, of students. So that raised the bar a little bit, right? You can't take that shot because you got to go in that order. So that is one thing I'm worried about, you know, but I don't think you should worry about it at all. I think if you get the right resources, the right study structure that I provide for you in smashusmle.com, you're going to be fine anyway, right? Because think about it. If you're taking the USMLE in 2020, this is not your problem. If you're taking it next year in 2021, this is not your problem. So before you start worrying about it as an IMG currently, who's saying, oh my God, step one is gonna be pass or fail. 
It doesn't matter. Okay, for the next two years, you need to get a three-digit score, which is going to be reported on your score that you're going to use to match into residency. So before you start panicking and getting worried, all right, understand that you don't have a lot of control. We have to wait for the MBME, okay, and the uh, FSB, uh, FSB um, uh, I'm saying they're saying it wrong now, but you know the the MBME uh, body for them to be able to make that decision, the USMLE body for them to boards uh, to be able to make that decision, and they're still gonna be listen over the next six months. Another information is gonna come out, and they're gonna tell us exactly how they're gonna proceed. And so you're, none of us are gonna be in the dark. I'm gonna be here to update each and every one of you guys to let you know exactly what's gonna be happening. Um, with the meetings they're going to be half happening, um, you know, and how they're going to be make, if the decision is going to be impacting students moving forward. Now, just a caveat: the main reason why they pass this um, pass fail actually is because medical students have had a lot of burnout, anxiety, severe depression, and anxiety over step one exam. All right, over the years, it's caused more stress in the life of medical students than anyone can ever imagine. But the problem is that. Yes, we've solved it by saying you can just pass and fail the test. But what you should be hoping for is that we open more residency programs. Think about it. Why do programs take two dermatology residents, two vascular surgery residents, four neurosurgery residents? I mean, that is just not a lot of open spot for people to get a job. But here's my thing. Currently, as I'm talking to you, multiple medical schools have been open over the last five years, more than in the last 30 years. And they're increasing the class size of each individual medical school class. When I went to medical school, at least when I graduated from Rowan, uh, I went from UMDNJ, it's now Rowan, uh, University School of Osteopathic Medicine. They used to, we used to, we started with 108. By the time I left the school, I think they were 160. I think they're hitting 200s now. Now think about it for this for a second. That's just my medical school. Every medical school across the country, they're increasing their class size every year, 200, 250. Now, if you keep doing that at that rate of growth of, you know, building more medical schools, increasing medical school classes, size, and you don't build residency programs for these students to train, you're creating a bottleneck. That is where the problem is, guys. I'm telling you, that is the main issue. All we need to do is lobby the U.S. government, get any excess money to be able to pump into residency program, have these guys create more residency programs with more residency spot, and we will eliminate all this anxiety and stress because, listen, if 17,000 people or 37,000 people are applying for a job market and there is at least 30, let's say 30, 35 or 37,000 jobs out there, right? Let's have, let's have 1,000 uh, 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 difference. At least that gives an opportunity for everyone, right? But the problem is we don't have enough jobs, guys. That is all it boils down to. They have not opened any, uh, they, they, the rate at which they're opening any new residency is so low, virtually almost non-existent, very, very minimal, and the rate is so slow. And I understand it takes time to build residency program, get faculty, attending physician academic physicians that will come and teach residents that is not an easy thing to put together but until we start to solve that problem we're going to keep having this step one step two ck mania because i guarantee you guys in the next five you know five years step two ck average is going to be like 250 and guess what we're going to do we're going to keep increasing that score that is what the problem is going to be right then it's going to boil down to who you know right so as an img currently listen you keep doing what you're doing right now. Don't stress yourself. Now, if you're just entering medical school today and you're going to be in the class of 2022 taking the first step one exam, when it's going to be pass or fail, right? Listen, you still got to pass that exam, right? So you still got to focus on knowing the information. So you might say, oh, wait a minute. Is pass or fail going to be easy for me to just do the bare minimum amount of work to pass step one? No, I wouldn't do that because what I have learned is that to pass the exam, you have to have a certain amount of knowledge. If you only barely pass step one and put a minimum effort, when that time actually comes, it's gonna bite you in the butt when you take step two CK. Because yes, we've gotten rid of the genetics and the biochem and all that stuff that's irrelevant on step two CK. But if you still don't understand your basic foundations and your basic physiology and basic pathology, when you get to step two CK and I'm asking you how to treat a disease that you don't even understand, it's still not gonna work for you. All right, so I don't want you to guys just rest on your OSS and say, hey, listen, Dr. Audition, yay, you know what, this is great news. All right, it's great news.
that you don't have to worry about getting 260 anymore in 2022. You don't have to worry about, you know, cr you know, crying in the middle of the night because you got a 227 and you wanted to get a 239 or 255, right? You don't have to worry about those anymore. But, but, you still have to remember, you still got to put in the work. The exam is not easy by any means. It doesn't get any easier by any means, all right? So, there's still a lot of unknowns. We still don't know. I still don't know exactly what is going to happen. This is my best prediction uh, based on basically what I've looked into, some of the research I've done, uh, looking on the um, USMLE website and kind of, you know, do some extra research, talking to a few people in residency uh, programs to kind of get a feel for like, all right, what are we going to be doing moving forward? Because listen, we still have to have some, some kind of objective data to be able to gauge different medical students. And as long as you're an IMG, guess what? You're going to need to score really, really high on that step two CK, which is going to, it's happening already, but that's going to be the bar moving forward in 2022. All right. Listen, if you have any questions at all, reach me at Dr. Adishina at ftplectures.com. I'm going to put my email below in the description below in this video. Also, you can check out, check me out on smashusmle.com. If you're struggling with the USMLE, you're having trouble understanding this concept, listen, it's not difficult. You just need the right coach. I'm here to coach with my team. We're going to show you exactly how to study for this board exam the right way. That's a method to the madness, guys. Listen, I've been doing this for 10 years. I know the game inside and out. You can literally rely on someone who's a board certified ER physician who's been doing this for that long and I care about your success. I'm going to put a link below in this video. Just click on that link and guess what? I'll be waiting for you. Till I see you guys next time, relax, don't panic. Everything will work out if you continue to work out. You guys take care. Bye-bye.